good. So I would like, with an eye on the clock, to uh, give the highlights of some of the more interesting aspects of essentially negative frequency physics. So the, the previous talk, Eugene's talk, uh, fits in very nicely and uh, uh, surprisingly with this talk. Now, what I'm hoping to uh, uh, communicate is the following uh, one-hour lecture in 20 minutes, in particular the Unruh effect, sometimes known as, or rather I should say, closely related to the dynamic Kashmir effect. And don't let me uh, go too far without emphasizing the fact that most of this physics is really better understood by looking at an accelerated mirror rather than an accelerated atom. Uh, the atom in a Minkowski vacuum, as indicated here on the uh, right-hand side, obeys the usual uh, light cone physics with the hyperbolic sine cosine uh, recipes for telling you where we are at what time. The Unruh effect came first from Jerry Moore, uh, who is in fact a member of our group for many years, a quantum optics guy, and he did his thesis at Brandeis on what happens when you have an accelerated mirror. And uh, Steve Pulling, a uh, professor at Texas A&M now, then a graduate student at Princeton, uh, explained much of that physics, uh, then that stimulated Hawking, and uh, so forth. Peter Maloney, in his excellent book on quantum vacuum physics, talks about the fact that it's hardly obvious why there should be an unruh effect. And in fact, Feynman, on his uh, last blackboard, has an indication there, you see, of acceleration temperature. Unruh temperature is something that is to be learned. Uh, by the way, Unruh told me that he didn't know why Feynman put that up there because he'd explained it to him. Uh, as we will see, there are many interesting facets, uh, of course, uh, uh, much of it coming from our friend Unruh. The point being, back in the day when we were trying to think about these issues in the simple way, if you have atoms, two-level atoms, falling through a ring laser cavity, accelerating as they fall, uh, then typically, as we uh, uh, think of uh, the physics associated with ordinary resonant absorption and emission. Uh, we have a photon absorbed, the atom excited. Now, in the Unruh effect, we have a photon emitted and the atom simultaneously jumping to the excited state. And this is uh, now something which uh, uh, I would... Mm, I would like to uh, uh, simply indicate by looking at the interaction Hamiltonian uh, where A is the annihilation operator for a photon with frequency nu and wave vector k all are expressed in terms of the proper time tau of the atom which is being accelerated. Uh, sigma is the raising operator for the atom and omega is the uh, atomic frequency. The point being then that if you do the calculation, just simply do first order perturbation theory, you find a surprising result, namely that the probability of excitation and emission goes like a Planck factor. And if you play with the algebra a little bit, uh, the only symbol up there that we're not familiar with is A, lowercase a. That's the acceleration. So the unruh temperature then uh, turns out to be linearly proportional to this acceleration, and uh, that's the uh, physics that we should understand is related to the deepest questions, but doesn't get us uh, where we would like to be. Looking at the mirror being fixed and the atom being accelerated, uh, we got the result of the previous view. Please to recall that the uh, uh, ground state, the uh, probability of having a photon of frequency nu in the yellow box uh, goes like a Planck factor 
in which, again, the frequency of the atom is what we find coming into the game. On the other hand, if we look at the problem in which the mirror is accelerated and the atom is fixed, something very interesting and very similar happens, except that now the Planck factor, going like exponential in the denominator, goes like the frequency nu, the frequency of the photon, not the atom. That's very important. And I'd like to emphasize then that the um, counter-rotating term physics, uh, the atom being excited gives you a flat spectrum, whereas with the mirror excited, we get the Planck spectrum. Now, black hole entropy is something that uh, we all hear about, and uh, it involves in the hands of, of uh, Hawking a beautiful first demonstration of the way in which a black hole can emit uh, particles and light. Uh, David Lee, a famous for helium-3 superfluidity, asked us one day, why is the entropy of a Hawking black hole, uh, as in the first equation in the top there, going like the area A, where that area is the area of 4 pi r gravity squared? And the uh, answer to that, uh, he wants not in terms of some Green's function analysis, but in terms of the simple hand waving. Uh, and so uh, what we did was to gather together a team uh, involving uh, people that I've mentioned and Don Page, one of Hawking's last postdoc, live in postdoc, uh, Wolfgang Schleich, a uh, quantum optics relativity expert, and likewise wonderful young lad, Straczynski. The black hole now uh, should be interrogated uh, to ask questions about the entropy flux radiated as an atom falls into the black hole. Lots of interesting issues here. If the atom is in free fall, then you would say it's not being accelerated and therefore not a candidate for unruh radiation. Uh, but in fact, what you must realize is that as the atom falls, the radiation field that is uh, uh, shown to it by the black hole is something new and interesting. And the probability then that a photon of frequency nu is emitted and the atom is excited goes like the green box. And there you see uh, in the denominator expression involving the rotational, I'm sorry, the RG, gravitational radius, and uh, the frequency nu of the emitted photon. So the RG is always, uh, of course, proportional to the mass of the black hole, and capital G is the radiation constant. So that the atoms falling into the black hole uh, give you, with the Planck factor, uh, exactly what we were seeing when the atom was stationary and the mirror was accelerated. Please do note now that P Hawking uh, goes like some factor which you can't see right off, but it's essentially the acceleration associated with or outshone by the atom. Now, how do we go from that one atom result to an entropy flux? Well, you do quantum optics like unto the quantum theory of the laser, which we won't talk too much about, but simply note that when you do the calculation, you find that the entropy flux goes like constants, Boltzmann's constant, and uh, the gravitational function, g, the gravitational constant, and we call that h-bar entropy, not to be confused with Hawking or Bekenstein. So this uh, horizon Brighton acceleration radiation has associated with it an entropy, entropy flux, which is exactly what Hawking would have told you, uh, but he didn't have any atom in his problem. He was looking at the problem from the perspective of the of fields generated in different frames. Now, we've then explained 
but the relativists knew very well. Let's see about uh, a couple of things that are of interest, but they're <coughs> not so well known in the relativity field uh, as Ginsburg and uh, Euler note. Uh, it isn't, it is obvious that at the time Einstein first formulated the equivalence principle is classical physics. The question of whether or not the equivalence principle holds for quantum phenomena is not trivial. And in our analysis, you can see that yes, there is a very direct correspondence, but it's not a correspondence associated with an accelerated atom, but with an accelerated mirror on the one hand, case B, and case C with a black hole warping the modes of the radiation associated with the emitted photon. Now, the remaining uh, couple of minutes, I'd like to uh, tell you about some things that uh, are involving the negative frequency perspective of these uh, uh, problems, and in, perspective, in, in, in particular then, the atom, as it follows along its hyperbolic trajectory, emits photons, which are of the black variety, and those are positive frequency, and the red variety, which are negative frequency. Please to note that this is not the creation and annihilation operator of positive and negative frequency business. Instead, it's something more like what goes on in Schwinkoff radiation. If you look at the expression of the Schwinkoff photon, they involve the frequency of omega, or nu sub k, divided by the index of refraction, minus this uh, velocity factor. And when the velocity is greater than the speed of light in the uh, medium, we get Schwinkoff radiation. And that Schwinkoff radiation is, in fact, negative frequency radiation. Uh, surprising result, then, suppose I have two atoms, one and two, and they're accelerating along side by side. What's the probability that atom one will emit a photon by the unroot process, and atom two will absorb it? The answer is zero. The reason <laughs> is because of negative frequency. Uh, paper which we recently uh, wrote with Bill Unruh, who, by the way, is now at Texas A&M, is, uh, <coughs> as indicated, I hope you can read the abstract. The abstract says, we all thought that uh, these problems were over and done with, but you'll find surprising results. For example, the photons emitted in the unroot process are two photons squeezed by photons. And that's very like what Aki had. So my voice and my time are running out simultaneously. Thank you for your attention. <coughs> <coughs>